Have you seen my peanut butter? I thought. Hey, there are. Jeez, that's not cranberry sauce. Oh, watch me. <laughs> Last time on Bad Movies Among Us. Some basic political fundraising turned to tragedy when the president's wife died in a horrific and totally believable car crash. Mike Banning lost his security job in response and now he's been bumped down to a demeaning desk job detail. North Korea, in a bid to outdo Drake, flew from the bottom to the top and now they're here. They've sieged the White House and they've got the whole team here. But poor Mike Banning, a fan of Drake, the White House, and America, has been devastated by this attack, possibly more than anyone. And after seeing his country under attack, he's had no choice but to act. En route to save the president, save the White House, and save America, Mike has already passed the oh-so-deadly-and-dangerous lawn and managed to make his way into the White House proper. He's gonna breathe. He's gonna count one, two, three. And after regaining his composure, he's gonna shrug off the deaths of his friends, family, and co-workers. He's gonna shove it deep down, way deep down, and he's gonna focus on saving America. And hopefully, hopefully, as long as he can keep his blood pressure down, take it easy, not push himself too hard, and maybe just take a nice little Swiss chard salad break to get in some good leafy greens and a little vitamin K bump, then maybe with that extra energy, maybe Mike Banny can save America. The standoff has now begun. Asian hacker lady, she has overridden the security protocols, while the myriads of terrorists declare over radio that the East Wing is secure. West Wing is secure. Apparently, they have just sieged the White House in no time flat. The news and media coverage is having a field day. We see multiple broadcasts declaring that the White House has fallen. Back in the Pentagon, we have a live broadcast feeding from the White House Peoc room. The broadcast starts off with hostages being killed live on camera. Again, just a very, very gory film. Many, many casualties. A lot of, lot of straight-to-the-face gunshots. So just be ready for that. Park tells the Secretary of Defense to stand down as he is in control of the White House. He threatens to kill the president live on camera if he doesn't obey. Ben, betrayed and understandably pissed, yells some not words at Forbes. A hostage is savagely executed in front of the president, panicking the remaining hostages. The remaining hostages are zip-tied to steel rails, and we are treated to a sad montage of the White House at twilight, the flag being taken down and flung off the roof without mercy by the terrorists. Bodies lay strewn around the grounds. In the background, the sun is setting. Mike has a moment of silence for his fallen comrade, but then... He gets right down to business investigating. Not even waiting for the sad music to end, Mike begins to search the bodies. He identifies that the terrorists are Korean. <laughs> Good job, Mike. Back in the Peoc, Park is boasting about how easily and quickly he dispatched the White House's special forces, saying that it takes our special forces 15 minutes to reach the White House. And he took it down in 13. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, meanwhile, Mike is, like, going shank-happy on a terrorist in the security room. He loots him and finds a picture of Connor in the terrorist's pocket. Again, very Metal Gear Solid, just looting the bodies, finding evidence, finding materials. So, Mike, he finds the picture of Connor in the terrorist's pocket, and he kind of freaks out a little. Because, honestly, nobody's going to be messing with Connor with Mike around. So, Mike, he goes on a rampage. He starts hacking up a storm on the computers turns off the internal security cameras using a bypass plug-in from a safe, and now Mike is about to go Solid Snake on North Korea's ass. We do take just a brief moment to switch over to the local hospital here, partially to show how, like, terrible North Korea is and how much devastation there was from that attack, and partially to distract from the obvious romance between Mike and Ben. At the hospital, Leah is being flooded with patients from the White House massacre. She tries to call Mike, but it doesn't go through, and there's no time to be upset about it now because there are patients' lives that need tending to. So now that we've established that there is a world outside of Mike and Ben, we're going to go back to Mike and Ben. Excellent. So with all of that switching back and forth, we switch back to the Peoc with Ben and Park. And Park informs us, I have no interest in your nuclear launch codes. By now your Pentagon has changed them, no? Park orders one of his guards to bring the president over to him. The guard goes over to Ben, bends down, and cuts the zip tie attaching him to the rail. He drags him off to another room while Ruth McMillan whimpers and cries. While she does actually have some dialogue here, because it's some of the only female dialogue in the movie, I guess I'll actually include it. 
So when the Big Bad Park instructs his lackey to go grab the president and bring him to him, Ruth E. M., Secretary of Defense, cries out, What are you doing, for Christ's sake? They, they, they're, they're, they're taking the president, you know, six feet over here. From there. He just said that. So they cut him free, and then Ruth, the Secretary of Defense, she lets out this low little murmur, Oh, sir, to wit the guards just yell out here, Keep it up. I'm actually not sure if this is supposed to be establishing material or if it's just a happy coincidence, but I do enjoy the fact that the guards just find her as annoying as I do. But I do think that Ruth's character just runs right back into one of my key and critical problems with Olympus Has Fallen, which is that they don't know how to write female characters, or they just don't try. But while we're here, I assume many of you have heard of the Bechtel test, and there are many that likely have not, or maybe just aren't fully aware of the whole critique and its standard. But hopefully at any length, I'll be able to just add a little here or at least help refresh. So, Bechdel test. Let's talk about it. The Bechdel test emerged, interestingly enough, as a concept stemming from a comic. Yes, a comic, and it was written by a famous cartoonist, Alison Bechdel. And the comic came out in 1985, and it was entitled The Rule. It was an incredibly simple comic and it featured two female friends in search of a movie to watch together for the evening, and it primarily focuses on one of the friends speaking to the other, describing her rules for movies that she watches. She tells her friend that she only watches movies that feature at least two women, that speak to each other about a subject that isn't a man. That's it. That's the whole Bechdel test. What I honestly find so fascinating about the Bechdel test is that it wasn't something that came from a professor of gender studies, it wasn't something that came from some person of elite stature or position. It came from a down-to-earth cartoonist, and I think the idea, it just, it rung so true. And I think it, it's admittedly not the best test of female representation, but it stands as sort of a baseline. And if we are judging this movie on the Bechtel test, man, does it fail. It just fails so terribly. Uh, it does It does have more than one female character, but it's kind of like, don't look into that too much. <laughs> the first lady dies in the first few minutes of the movie and literally dies in the first 30 seconds of the theatrical trailer. And you, you just can't. You can't kill off the first lady of the United States of America in the trailer for your movie, much less in the first 30 seconds of the trailer. It's bad. It's a rough start. And then you have these characters, these other female characters, never interacting with each other, never even in the same room as one another, I mean, like, unless they're being tied up and held up as hostages. And their dialogue, the dialogue that they do have, is so minimal. It is cries of pain, cries of pain and allegiance. And then when we kill them off, out of convenience, we kill off any woman too close to the central plot because, geez, it's just too hard to write female characters nowadays. I mean, <laughs> what would you even have a woman say to another woman in an action movie where terrorists have stormed the White House and hundreds of people have been injured? What could they even possibly have to talk about? Have them talk about medical stuff in the hospital? Or try to help formulate an escape plan in Peoc? While Gerard Butler and Aaron Eckhart are just strutting around like a pair of natural beasts? I think not. I think obviously these two gentlemen should be the focus of any and all of the limited female dialogue. <laughs> my glib sarcasm aside, I think you can see all of my issue with this movie and how it addresses its female characters. It's one thing to be bad at writing female characters because you're a dumb chode who's never interacted with a member of the opposite sex, but it's another thing to just kill them off so casually. All of the female characters in this movie are just treated with that same callow disregard, where the moment we don't have anything more for them to say or do in a given scenario that we pre-planned out for them, we kill them off. We throw a few bullets in them, or we chuck them off a bridge or whatever, but we get rid of them. And we get rid of them permanently so that we don't have the minor inconvenience of having to address what happens to them later. It's sad, and it's pretty obvious in my opinion. And yes, yes of course, I have feelings here. I have some strong feelings on this one, and how it treats its female characters. I watch bad movies, and bad movies can, yes, tend to be a little misogynistic. Maybe more than a little. They often feature some bad female representation, over-sexualization, bad morals and motifs and all sorts of things like that, but gosh darn, Olympus Has Fallen does not treat its female characters very well. I imagine none of this is helped by the audacious fact that none of the characters, none of the roles, were actually written for women. The women that you do see in this movie were either thrown in at the last minute, or they were originally written as male characters. 
So back with Park and Ben and Piok. Apparently Park wants to play with Ben a little bit more. He has his guard cut him free and then brings him three feet over to him instead of just walking over to where Ben was, where he's already had him tied up. Ben demands to know who he's working for and this is where Park does his best Batman impersonation. I'm working for justice, he says. I'm working to give millions of starving men and women and children a chance at more than just subsistence. Okay, so, in other words, he's working for North Korea, that's what that means. Park, he says that he's working to bring an end to the Korean War. And by ending the Korean War, he'll finally be able to put an end to the suffering, poverty, and K-pop once and for all. Ben eyes his former ally from across the room. Who's that? Oh yeah, it's Forbes. He shouts up, calling Forbes a traitor. What's, what's, what's the going the rates for souls nowadays? He asks him. And this pisses Forbes off so much. Forbes runs over and he just slaps Ben around like a little bit right here and starts yelling at him saying, What did you say to me? What did you say to me? Forbes tries to turn the table, saying that Ben was the one who sold out his country long before he ever did, asking, How much does it cost to buy an election nowadays anyway? A few hundred million dollars? I'm a rookie compared to you. Ben headbutts him. <laughs> Seriously, he might be the spunkiest president I've ever seen on film. Park orders his men to find Connor. They're, they're not going to find him. That storyline will never come to full fruition. But for some reason, not only do we keep establishing it, but we never bothered to edit those little bits out. So we'll continue to hear little bits about Connor, only to see him for just a few moments. Just a tiny little bit. And really just never to use that storyline whatsoever. Which, frankly, it's, it's just such a shame. I think we all wanted Home Alone in the White House, but I'm sure someone realized at some point that this movie had become way, way too gory to be sending a 14-year-old to sort things out. I still think it would have been pretty fun, though, to see Mike going hall-to-hall -hall shooting terrorists dead blank in the face while Connor was using Macaulay Culkin-style traps to non-fatally wound other terrorists at the same time. In the same movie. The possibilities. How sad, right? What could have been? I mean, it really... It really almost happened, too, is the thing. But sadly... Sadly, no. That silliness was sidelined so Gerard Butler could single-handedly face-blast two dozen terrorists. You know. To show how patriotic he is. So back at the Pentagon, with both the President and Vice President compromised, the Speaker of the House has become acting president of the United States of America. Once again, we have Morgan Freeman as the president. And now I think everything seems actually just a little bit more calm and safe. Um, Aaron Eckhart, great guy and everything like that, but I feel much safer with Morgan Freeman as the president. Now things are going to get figured out. Lynn, director of the Secret Service and one of the only surviving female characters. Oh, see, here's a strong, confident woman that gets to speak and doesn't get killed by terrorists. <laughs> Don't worry, they kill her in the sequel! Kaboom! Just like that! <laughs> <laughs> well, for now, Lynn, she assigns protective services to Speaker of the House, Alan Morgan Freeman. And Alan Morgan Freeman takes his newfound position with grace and poise as he is hit with all of the problems of the day all at once. He sighs. But in a moment's sigh, he formulates the issue in his head. He asks if the President and the Vice President are alive. They are, she tells him. Unfortunately, though, They've already assassinated the South Korean Prime Minister. Morgan Allen Freeman looks down for a second. He walks over to the President's chair and directs the Joint Chiefs of Staff to sit down. Mike, meanwhile, he's broken into the Oval Office. He's sneaking around the White House. He checks the President's phone. The line is dead. He goes over to the side of the room and flips a painting to reveal a hidden safe stored within the wall. He apparently knows the code to this safe, and they haven't changed it. He punches it in precisely, pulling out a super-secret Bluetooth earpiece that connects him to the Pentagon through a perfectly precise point-to-point -point satellite relay. But back at the Pentagon, it's confirmed that yes, it is in fact the Gerard Butler on the phone. Thank God. Gerard tells the Pentagon he's inside the White House, which means he's a man on the inside and very much ready to save the day. He just needs someone to tell him not to first. The Pentagon goes into a heated debate on Mike's dependability. Lynn says he's one of their best agents, but oh, he got removed from the president's protection detail because he was responsible for the death of the first lady. Please. 
But with no other intelligence coming out of the White House, they have no choice. President Speaker of the House Morgan Allen Freeman radios Mike Butler Banning to get a debrief on the situation. Back in the Oval Office, Mike is now in full solid snake mode. He arms himself with guns, armor, and an attitude that says, I don't work for no one. Mike debriefs the Pentagon in his situation. Armed commandos are patrolling the hallway, he says. C4s and other explosives are rigged up at all the doors and windows. And anyone that could be called in to help is super frickin' dead. They've shut the power down, despite all the lights we've seen. Mike tells us the lights are off, even though they look on, and the air vents are sealed, and the surveillance is dead. Mike asks us about Connor, but they have no status on the president's son. When? When Mike wonders, When is this gonna turn into Home Alone this 4th of July with Gerard Butler and Finley Jacobson? The Pentagon informs us that they have no status on this situation, but Finley Jacobson is presumed to be somewhere inside, and if Gerard Butler can find him, they might still be able to make a Home Alone ripoff yet. Mike gazes longingly at all of Ben's photos on the Oval Office desk before leaving. But right as he's about to leave, a super-secret ninja agent enters the room armed with a semi-automatic assault rifle. Mike takes no hesitation. He kicks him, punches him, disarms him, and then flips him over all in one quick go. Where the super-secret ninja agent gets up, trying to fight back, he pulls out a super-secret sidearm, but Mike disarms him again. They fight, punching, kicking. It's the kind of style where it looks like someone who's trying to imitate MMA, but they've only really seen professional wrestling. Mike just knocks him to the ground, punches him in the face, and again, and again. Just for good luck, he gives one more punch to the face, and then just grabs this bust of Abraham Lincoln, and then just smashes him in the face just bashes his face in with this bust of Abraham Lincoln. That was a bust of Abraham Lincoln, and Mike just flattened a terrorist skull with it like he didn't have nothing else to work with. So we switch back to the Pentagon. And Morgan Allen Freeman is now on a giant flat screen sat phone with the head of the terrorist, Park. And Park, he wastes no time. He has new demands. He wants the 7th Fleet to be withdrawn from the Sea of Japan. He wants for all American troops to be withdrawn from the demilitarized zone in Korea. And if his demands are not met, he's going to start executing hostages. He gives them until dawn. The Pentagon is antsy. Something needs to be done or people are going to die. Everyone looks to Morgan Allen Freeman, who, again, sighs. He sighs as he once again takes on the weight of the world on his shoulders. Like Atlas, Freeman takes the momentary repose of a man who's held such a weight many times before. General Clegg? And Director of Secret Service, they argue, laying out the critical Catch-22 that the newly empowered acting President Allen finds himself in. U.S. General Edward Clegg tells him that pulling the troops from the DMZ and withdrawing the 7th Fleet would be disastrous. Seoul, the capital of South Korea, would be defenseless. And if the North Koreans advanced, Seoul could fall within 72 hours. Director Lin, however, says that if he doesn't pull the troops and the 7th Fleet, they could execute more hostages. They might even execute the president and who knows what they'd do to Connor. That is, if he is actually in there. This is the first point where they start to de-invest from this whole subplot that they've been developing but never cashing in on. We are 51 minutes into the movie at this point, by the way, and we have been developing the Connor subplot since the beginning of Act 1, and only now, only halfway through the movie, have we realized we never really had anything that we could do with that. We had no real plans for this character, and for a long while we thought, oh, we'll just have him be Macaulay Culkin. But the problem is, direct injecting Kevin McAllister into Die Hard doesn't actually make a lot of sense. And integrating him thoughtfully would require thoughtful integration. And man, these writers don't have that up their sleeves. You know, I mean, just God bless them. They can, I mean, they can kind of write, like, Bruce Willis action scenes and some Bruce Willis dialogue, but that might be about it. They, they can't write characters. You know, it makes them nervous. Luckily, though, we have casting directors to just fill roles with female voices, so at least there is some kind of woman here. And Lynn, I think she might be one of my favorites in this movie. Angela Bassett does a lot to fill out this role. She's given a lot of jank dialogue. She's given a bulk of the establishing and de-establishing Connor dialogue, and she somehow keeps you from really noticing that this whole subplot was cut from the story. And really, acting President Morgan Allen Freeman doesn't seem too concerned with the subplot being cut either. So why should I be? 
He takes in his advisor's advice, pauses for just a moment. He, he has a plan. But first, he wants a coffee. With cream. Three Sweden loaves. And in an actual mug, not that paper cup bullshit. It's, it's almost like this was his biggest aspiration. To become president. Also that he could order coffee whenever he wants, just by calling it out to his secretary. Very pleased with himself. Very pleased with his coffee order. He begins laying down some orders. He wants all of the nuclear sites secured. He wants to speak with an expert on North Korea. Then, he wants to speak with the premier of North Korea on a secure line. After that, he wants to speak with the Russians, the Chinese, the British, and the French. Then set up a press conference in that order. It's very, very organized. Very, very ready to do this. Almost like he had been thinking this out for a minute. So, back in the Piak with Park. Park is once again strutting his feathers in front of Ben. And Ben, he is once again zip-tied up to that frickin' rail. And Park... Park has managed to walk the 4.5 feet over to him without incidents. So why, why did he cut his zip tie before? Like, let's just check this, shall we? When we brought Asher here in originally, we zip tied him to the rail. Then cut that zip tie almost immediately to move him, you know, four, four and a half feet. Then we zip tie him to a chair. Then minutes later, off camera, we cut that zip tie. We then move him back over to the rail where we then zip tie him again and I... I'm just saying, you guys are going to run out of zip ties if you're not careful. It's classic resource management mistakes, if you're asking me. But Park, not worried about zip ties, like at all. Park is only worried about injustice. And in order to get the justice for his injustice, he needs three super secret codes. To one super secret, super stupid, super nuclear failsafe. The failsafe is called the Cerberus system, and I'm just going to save myself a little time later. So let's go ahead and give you a nice big exposition dump right here and we'll give you a rundown on the Cerberus system because frankly, no one online seems to understand how this convoluted plot device actually works. So I'm going to explain it to you so that you actually get it. And if you don't understand, that's fine because it's really freaking stupid. You know, it, it's a really stupid plot device, but we are going to go through it right here and right now. Oh yes, call the Cerberus system because again, three codes, three headed dog, Guarding the gates of hell, guarding destruction. But also, beyond that, let's get into how it functions, shall we? So, I'm going to try and explain it. So Park, he wants to gain control of the Cerberus system. This is a top-secret nuclear failsafe designed, in theory at least, to allow one to stop a nuclear strike after the strike has been ordered, but before it has made landfall. Here's how it works. After the nuclear strike has been ordered, if one has decided they made a big, big oopsie, or just accidentally spilled their coffee on some computer, or hit their elbow on, like, the nuclear football, and just ordered an accidental nuclear strike, you can now activate the Cerberus system to stop that nuclear strike. The Cerberus system, when activated, will detonate any designated nuclear weapon under the U.S.'s control after a diehard-style five-minute timer has been depleted. In order to activate the Cerberus system, three separate codes must be entered. Each code is known to only one individual for some reason, and all three codes must be entered at the White House in a super-secret Cerberus terminal that only exists inside the White House. So, just to understand who is necessary, in order to activate the Cerberus system, you need the Joint Chief of Staff because one code is held by him. You would also need the Secretary of Defense also at the White House, because one code is held by the Secretary of Defense, and you, of course, would need the President also at the White House, all together having a jazzy time with some tea and crumpets, because one code is held by the President. So, if while ordering nuclear strikes and having your tea and crumpets, you were to be like, oh man, we, we shouldn't have ordered that nuclear strike, why did we do that? One could enter the Cerberus codes. Now, the Cerberus system does not allow one to launch missiles at all. It only detonates them, and only after this five-minute timer. So yes, any strange love fans, this is a military defense system designed specifically to keep Slim Pickens and other assholes like him from riding nuclear weapons into Russian cities like some kind of half-cocked cowboy riding a fucking Bronco. And so yeah, in practicality, what has to happen is the president has to order a nuclear strike while having tea and crumpets, with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, with the Secretary of Defense, 
and then be like, oops, and then all of them agree that, man, we really shouldn't have ordered that nuclear strike against that country for being bad for whatever reason. Let's call that off. And then, as long as you had at least five minutes before landfall was made, you could, in theory, detonate the nuclear weapon in the air. Not deactivate it. Not, not anything convenient like that. No, no, just explode it up in the air where it can shower radiation all over whatever landscape it happens to be on after that five-minute timer goes down. Rock and roll, right? Nuclear crisis averted. And right now, what everyone's supposed to be thinking is that that is what Park wants. He wants the codes so that he can prevent nuclear weapons from being launched against North Korea. And in order to gain that security, he needs all three of these Cerberus codes. Again, very Metal Gear Solid, it could be a video game. Park cuts Admiral Hoeing's zip tie and pulls him over to the chair in front of Ben, forcing his head down against a seat. Now, he puts the blade of a knife against Admiral Hoeing's neck, threatening him for the code. And not wanting to see Hoeing die in front of him, Ben tells Hoeing to tell Park the code. They'll never get mine, he declares. So, Hoeing tells him the code. Just really that easy. Just the president messing everything up and giving away the nuclear codes, just willy-nilly like it's no big deal. The Pentagon is immediately notified of the Cerberus code being entered, while Mug notices that all of the terrorists share the same tattoo on their inner ear. He calls the Pentagon to debrief. They tell him a Cerberus code has been entered, but not what a Cerberus code is, and Mike has questions. What's a Cerberus? That's classified, shouts General Clegg. Classified? Really? Right now, I think I have a proverbial need to f***ing know. And so Mike is debriefed about Cerberus. The President, the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, everyone is in the same place right now. And the terrorists have them. And if they get the Cerberus codes, well, that could make America vulnerable to attack. Moreover, they're looking for Kana right now. The President, he'll hold out as long as he can. But if they find Kana, if they find his son, well, no one can hold out under those circumstances. Park, back at the White House, is watching security footage. He's just casually watching this video with like a dozen dead people in it who are just lying on the ground, nothing else to watch, and just happens to notice someone strolling around the dead bodies. And who could it be? But of course, Mike, the only person who's alive. Now aware of Mike's presence in the building, as Forbes identifies him on the security camera, Park has some questions, and he questions Forbes if Mike is going to be a problem. But Forbes, he assures Park that Mike is nothing to worry about. Doubting Forbes, though, Park sends out a troop of his best commie ninjas to hunt Mike down. But Mike, <laughs> Mike is, Mike is Solid Snake, remember? He's sneaking through the White House, armed to the teeth with guns and grenades, and silent as the dead of night, ain't no one stopping him today. The terrorist commando finally have reached Mike's position, but that sneaky Mike has already ducked out, using the White House's secret passageways. Somehow, Park gets Ben on the line on the Bluetooth, and he just casually kind of forces him into American history trivia, asking him the $100,000 question, Did Truman gut the White House in 1949 or 1948? But really, this is more of a rhetorical question, because the real point of the question is that Park knows that the walls are hollow, and that they have secret passageways in them. Park, he's really a bastion of American history knowledge. He's very well researched and seems to know an awful lot about the country he hates so much. He tells his men, Mike is in the walls. And he is in the walls. And, and so is Connor. So we have a brief moment where second father and second son have a touching reunion with Mike saying that he should have known Connor would be behind the walls, as it was his favorite hiding place. Mike tells the Pentagon that he's found Connor, a.k.a. Sparkplug. I think that just about everything and everyone in this movie has a cone name behind it, and I think Sparkplug is one of the stupidest. The commandos begin firing through the walls as Mike grabs Connor and runs down the hallway, firing back with a single pistol. He exits the walls now, and back inside the White House proper, he begins to try and lead Connor to safety, all while the super troop of commie ninjas follow close behind them. It's very, very tense. Mike guides Connor to what looks like a basement where he gets ready to drop him out of a ventilation shaft where possibly some security unit or something like that will hopefully, you know, get him to safety. But Connor, Connor wants Mike to come with him. But he can't. 
He's got a country to save. Mike tells him that he's going to find his dad, and to do, just as he's taught him, scale down the shaft. Meanwhile, the super commie ninjas reach the room where Mike and Connor were hiding, and one of them sees the open ventilation shaft. Connor's still inside, but Mike, he just mashes that X button, choke holding the commando before snapping his neck. Connor escapes from the White House and is escorted to safety via an armed unit. All said and done, he was in danger for just under four minutes of screen time. He was found, shuffled downstairs, and tossed down a laundry chute. Done and done. Uplifting music plays as if we had any doubts that Connor was going to make it out okay. Acting President Morgan Allen Atlas Freeman gives the nation a good pep talk, the way only a Morgan Freeman can, letting them know that despite today's events, the U.S. government remains 100% intact. The president, boop, 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 he's still alive, guys. And also, that tonight's fireworks show will proceed as scheduled, and to please make sure and stay for Punch and Politics afterward, which will also proceed as scheduled. Also, to let all of you know that those who criticize without understanding, you seek only to address your own personal feelings. That is selfish thinking, Zenzi. It does not serve the nation. Mike, meanwhile, he's still having some close-quarter combat in the White House alleyway. He knocks out two commie ninjas before tying them up, and he then begins his own brand of interrogation. He starts getting all chummy, talking at these two soldiers like he's real familiar with them, and he's just kind of loosely pointing a knife at one of them while he's talking to them. You can tell he just really wants a drama apple for this scene. Just like a nice dramatic apple that he can slice up with his knife while he's just casually interrogating these guys. Then he can take a nice big old bite of that apple before setting the apple down and, and getting subsequently down to business. Appleist, though. Appleist, these two soldiers just laugh at him <laughs> because this is a silly interrogation without one, and this is when he just straightens up and he buries his knife into one of the guy's throat. He might not have an apple, but this has left the other soldier not laughing at all. If Mike had an apple, perhaps, his comrade's laugh could have been spared, but no. Mike asks him, who he works for, and the man starts speaking Korean. Mike, Mike, he stabs him in the thigh in response, having apparently decided at some point that Park was not nearly intimidating enough of a name for a supervillain, we find out here that Mr. Park's real name is actually Yong Sak Kang. Now, Kang, Kang, that is a, that's a supervillain name, so Kang, he is apparently the leader of a Korean paramilitary unit dedicated to uniting North and South Korea called United Freedom. Kang, as it turns out, is one of the most wanted criminals in all of the world. And as a child, he was brought across the DMZ border after his father was executed for crimes against the North Korean state. While crossing the border, his mother was killed by an American landmine. He masterminded the 2004 bombing of the British Embassy in Seoul and funneled Pyongyang uranium enrichment technology from Pakistan. He had never been photographed before by a Western intelligence agency. Until now. Hence, why no one could recognize him as Mr. Park. But now, now we know, Mr. Park Kang. Now that they know who they're dealing with, the next order of business is to get into the president's bunker and save the president and his cabinet. Except now, Kang calls Mike and starts addressing him directly. Calling the White House, his house. He belittles Mike for his failures. Telling him there's nothing he can do to atone for his past. Nothing will redeem him of the First Lady's death. He hangs on this point quite a bit. But Mike is steadfast and is ready to wreck Kang up. Kang, he drops the bomb. Not not the real bomb. Not, not one of the nuclear bombs or anything. Just the proverbial bomb. You know, letting us know that he knows. That the terrorists know. That Mike has a wife. Dun dun dun! Now, Mike's wife might not know that the terrorists know that he has a wife, and she might not know that we know that Mike knows that the terrorists know that he has a wife, but we know we know. And knowing we know this, we can safely classify this known threat as a known known, and we can go on knowing the stakes which are truly at hand. All of this talk of known knowns and known unknowns, however, this all just rubs Mike the wrong way, and he tells Kang to f*** right the f*** off. The formerly parked but recently renamed Kang remains cool, calm, and collected. He just turns to Forbes and says, Go kill him. And Forbes, Forbes just hobbles off like some Frankenstein's monster or something, 
It's just remarkably unceremonious. He just says those three words to Forbes, and off Forbes goes to murder Mike. Kang. He has his lackeys cut a couple more of his precision cable ties, instructing them to bring the Secretary of Defense, Ruth McMillan, over to him. And Ruth... Ruth the M. Man. She... She just does a terrible job acting in this scene, you know? It's a... In this scene, and in every scene she's in in this movie, frankly, and I know she's trying to act scared and whatnot, but holy hamburgers, this is not what you wanted. Like, scared is one thing, uh, Ruthie B, but she's not acting scared. She's acting more like a feral cat that someone has decided to just grab and try and drag home. She... she kicks... She grunts, she whimpers, and, uh, she grimpers as they drag her over, just kicking and screaming. Her eyes are watering, her hair is a mess. I know, she looks awful. Her face is all puffy and her makeup is all smeared and uneven. And I get that she was, like, taken hostage, but it's like, have some respect, you're a woman. You can at least look half decent for your male captors. Jeez. And then also, like, your hair, like, WTF. I was taken hostage. The United States is under attack. The White House is under siege. And you're upset my hair got a little ruffled up while I was being assaulted? Yeah, but here's the thing. It's like, did your hair get all messed up when you were taken hostage? Because I'm just saying, like, your hair, it doesn't look like hostage hair. Like, it looks more like I woke up with bedhead hair and I just wanted to do nothing about it. I was taken hostage. Yeah, you keep saying that, but, like, there's hostage hair, and then there's, like, whatever you have going on over there. And frankly, frankly, I hate it, and I think you look like a demonic sock puppet that came to life. And I just thought if someone comes by with a chainsaw and some gasoline so they can saw you off of Bruce Campbell's forearm and set you on fire and send you back to the bowels of whatever fashion hell you came from. So the terrorists drag the Secretary of Defense, Ruth McMillan, to her feet, demanding she give them her server's code. She says a... Firm no, and Parker King, he just slaps her across the face. Yeah, take that, you mascaraless That's what you get for not doing your makeup. OMG, that's just what I was thinking. Thanks for being so supportive, Raul. For a moment, I thought I was being overly critical, but then, like, in my head, I'm like, no, 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 honey. She does look awful. Right across the face, just knocking her to the ground. It's a pretty funny slap, honestly, and it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie, but frankly, I hate Ruth McMillan as a character, so watching her get slapped in the face, I'm sorry, it's... <sighs> it's just... <laughs> it's, a, it's just a little cathartic, you know? Um, so Kang, or Park, or whichever you prefer, he asks for the code again, and she says, You'll have to kill me! Gutsy, she gets a, a kick for that comment. A kick apparently strong enough to cause her to bleed internally as she coughs up some blood from that. Park Kang's henchmen push her back towards him, as she rolls over on the floor, and Madam Secretary, very strong of will, won't give up her code as she is dying from the sheer amount of abuse that she is suffering from, Park Kang grabs her by the neck, lifting her back to her feet, and she just keeps making more of those Ruth McMillan sounds. Those weird, guttural sounds that are supposed to be the sounds of someone in pain, but really, just, they're just the sound of someone who's, like, desperately ill. That's what it honestly sounds like, like someone who is sick. Like, bad sack. Um, Park King quotes an old Japanese proverb to her, and in response, she says, F*** you! Through gargled groins. And, and Park King, he, you know, he punches her again in the stomach just for good measure, and then pimp slaps her back down to the ground. Ben, trying to be supportive, you know, of, of Ruthie M, and the way that she looks, with her terrible, terrible makeup job, he, he just keeps telling them to stop, and finally, Ben orders Ruth to give Kang the code, telling Park Kang that he won't ever get his code from him. So Kang, Kang takes the already disabled Ruth McMillan and just kicks her down off the platform they're on, down a couple of stairs, you know, just for kicks and grins. And let's be frank, I might be pretty glib with my humor regarding Ruthiem, but really, I think everyone should understand that this is a writer-director issue much more than an actor one. I think that they really didn't know what to do with female characters in hostage situations, besides having them be weak or scared or abused and beaten, so that a male character could come in, rescue them, and save the day. It's, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone has that movie that, that just to them 
says bad female representation, but man, this is like one of those movies for me. And as much as Varen and Raul might drag on Ruth in this movie, it's it's really not Melissa Leo's fault. She's an actress. She's not makeup. She's not costumes. And she's certainly not the one directing how those things are supposed to look. The one thing that made me, she's a little bit wee tiny little bit responsible for are those noises that are supposed to sound like pain and suffering, but really just sound like making sick. Even if it's not her fault, she still looks awful in this scene. She looks like Violet Beauregard after having all the blueberry juice sucked out of her. She looks like Shelley Duvall if Jack Nicholson had cut up to her with a bat. <laughs> she looks like Lennon after Chapman. She looks like a raccoon on top of a trash can that was smeared with raspberry jam. She looks like Betty Rubble if she were struck by lightning. She looks... Oh jeez, Vera. <laughs> I feel, I feel like we've gone too far. And I've got more. I got more. No. No, five is plenty, Vera. Okay, if you insist. So Ruth. Ruth does finally give up her code after being kicked down the flight of stairs, and you see the life just just fade from her eyes as she says it. Not, not because she's dying. No. Because she's dooming the country. And she would have gladly died for that secret, but an order's an order, and Benjamin Asher ordered her to tell Kang the code, and so she had to. They drag her another few feet before throwing her to the ground again, and yes, she moans, and she curses in a way that is both funny and sounds gross. But we've, we've probably made enough fun of Ruth for now, so let's move on. Let's talk about Forbes. Forbes is back in the White House proper, out of the Peoc, and he's stalking the hallways, and he is looking for Mike, but good old Solid Snake, he gets the drop on him. Forbes throws the, I'm your friend, it's me, line, and Mike sadly falls for it. Forbes plays the victim for a moment. They both kind of sit down, and Forbes telling Mike that Mike scared the shit out of him. Forbes fakes a little emotion over the death of his comrades. Not, not well, but he tries. They have a little back and forth dialogue here, and Forbes, he begins acting erratically, and just kind of accidentally drops Kang's name. Mike catches on and asks Forbes how he knows Kang's name. Caught in the act, Forbes tries to lightly play off before tossing a cigarette into Mike's face, launching into a tackle maneuver. But Mike, Mike is stronger, so he bull rushes him backwards, back into the next room, and he slams him onto a table. They begin wrestling for Forbes' gun, firing bullets in random directions. It's close quarter combat time, and Mike, he's a pro. Remember? Remember the beginning of the movie? Remember set up and pay off? We, we, we saw him boxing, he's a boxer. And so a little bit of boxing, and a little back and forth hand to hand before Mike gives him a, a nice little throat punch. Forbes pulls out a knife and begins slashing, slashing at Mike repeatedly, but Mike dodges left. He dodges right. He grabs Forbes' arm and slapping Forbes, knocking him to the ground. Forbes gets back up and comes at Mike with a knife, but Mike disarms him, stabs him in the chest with his own knife. Forbes, now fatally wounded, falling to the ground, and with nothing left to do but die for the country he betrayed, Forb finally makes amends. He asks Mike what he can do, and Mike instructs him. He gets on the wire, he calls Kang, and tells Parker Kang that Mike is dead. Mike nods in agreement, before finally putting Forbes out of his misery. Put him out of his misery? What the f*** are you talking about? It looks like he stabbed him in the f skull with his own knife! It did. It did look like Mike stabbed him in the skull in a violent, painful, thrusting manner, but but it transitions out so it could have been any angle. And it, yeah, I'm sure it was a nice, gentle, loving, loving stab in the skull. Back in the bunker, Ruth and Ben make a poor excuse for small talk. But I mean, what can you, what can you talk about during a hostage situation, honestly? Like, nothing new is happening. It's the same old boring hostage situation. Ben admits his regret for running for president. Ruth asks how her hair looks, which honestly just cracks me up so much because at least at least Melissa Leo understands what a poor job they did with her character and her character's whole presentation, her outfit, her makeup, her hair, because it doesn't come off good. And I think she sees it, and I think that's why she says so. Ruth, though. Ruth, she praises Benjamin Asher, saying that he's been a good president and that she won't go down without a fight. Back at the Pentagon, Morgan Allen Freeman is talking with Mike again. Morgan wants to take advantage of the low count of roof sentries and lack of air defense grid to send in seals through the roof. But Mike advises them to wait until he checks it out. But because two out of three of the Cerberus codes have already been entered, they aren't waiting any longer. Mike, 
He makes a beeline to the roof in response. We get some helicopter montage here as the SEALs are flying to the White House, and Kang is, is actually apparently aware of the incoming SEALs. And he apparently has another secret weapon, also American military, trained on them and ready to take them out of the sky. Mike, somehow not really sure how, discovers that the terrorists have found a top-secret American weapon, and he tells the Pentagon to hold back. But they aren't holding back. But they should be, because this secret weapon is the Hydro-6. It's the Hydro-6, Mike shouts in vain. No! Because that, the Hydro-6, that is two more than the Hydro-4 and twice as many as the Hydro-3. The SEALs are on their way to a death trap. A Kami ninja discovers Mike while he's alerting the Pentagon. Mike rushes over to him, grabbing him while he shouts out to his Nazi ninja Kami comrades in Korean. Mike shoots him in the leg while holding on to him. Another one comes in through the entrance. Mike shoots him, one shot, dead in the face, splattering blood on the wall behind him while another one comes in through the opposite entrance. Mike flips around the guy that he's holding, using him as his body's shield while he one-shots the new intruder in the face as well. Another ninja comes in through the door number one, and Mike tosses his human shield to the ground, giving him a nice single tap to the forehead before ducking around a corner. The door number one ninja blasts semi-automatic gunfire in Mike's direction, but Mike waits patiently for him to reload, waiting for that just right moment to duck back around the corner and shoot him dead in the foot. And then as he falls from the foot shot a couple times in the chest, just for good luck. Mike takes a quick few seconds to search some storage lockers before finding himself a luckily hidden RPG. He eyes around the corner. All looks safe. So he starts to make his way to the rooftop to save the seals he said not to send. While all this is going on, the Pentagon have, as you remember, dispatched the seals. And they're all flying straight at the White House in a series of six helicopters. And they, they come in within range of the Hydro 6. Remember, like I said, it's, it's one more than the Hydro 5 and equivalent to three of the Hydro 2s. So the moment the helicopters come in range, they just start getting blasted out of the air. In this scene, it just feels like one of those bad RTSs from the early 2000s. Like, like in so many ways. You have the corny green radar screen that shows the helicopters attacking, flying back and forth while these vastly overpowered anti-air guns just mow them down and you're watching these people back in the Pentagon like a bunch of first-time StarCraft players that just sent their entire army of Zerglings against a line of Turin tanks in siege mode and they're just watching them get blown away and they got no idea what to do. These helicopters are just getting shot from the sky so fast there's really no reason we needed to waste the CGI budget to animate them at all. One of the helicopter pilots cries out on the radio, We need backup. And I'm just like, no, don't send backup. Yeah, do it. Send more people to their doom. One by one, these helicopters come crashing down until only two are left. And that's, that's about when the hero of our movie and guest of the Ellen show, Gerard Butler, shows up to save the day, making his way to the rooftop RPG still in hand and seeing what is happening to his brothers in arms. Mike acts fast, blowing up the turret with his RPG just as one of the helicopters almost comes crashing down on top of Mike. The helicopter comes falling out of the sky, Mike doing a dramatic baseball slide to second base down the side of the rooftop and drops through a hole as the helicopter crashes into the roof of the White House in the same spot where he just was. The tail rotor flies off of the helicopter and comes barreling towards him threatening to cut Mike to pieces. He lets go of the ledge he's holding onto, following through an unexplained hole in a building and crash landing back into the living quarters of the White House. <sighs> Phew. The helicopter explodes in a fire explosion of ferocious fire. Also. And then the Pentagon mopes in defeat because, again, they sent all these seals to their death. You know, that was six helicopters down the tube. If only they'd listen to Mike. If only, if only they'd listen to Mike when he had told them to wait, but nobody ever listens to Mike Banning. Ah, Kang. Kang now admonishes the Pentagon for their failures. Now they are the foolish ones who have made failures from which they can never recover and never redeem themselves. And their lack of poor planning and execution skills has left them in a poor situation. To let them know how upset he is at this entire situation, at everything that has gone down, at the Pentagon's poor response, King one-shots another hostage live on camera, just to make sure they all know he's super surreal. He threatens that the president is next, and he gives them an hour to meet his demands, but they're not going to need an hour. Once again, Parker Kang. 
he threatens that the president is next and gives him out to meet his demands. He wants those troops, the ones at the DMZ, he wants those troops out of there. That 7th Fleet and the Fleet of Japan, get that out of there. Also, also, although, although actually also, a fully fueled helicopter on the White House lawn, please and thank yous in with an hour, thank you. So, maybe don't shoot this one down then, smart guy. Yeah, it's it's pretty dumb. It's it's pretty dumb to think anyone would think that they could escape in a fully fueled helicopter. It's 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 not believable. Mike awakens from his two story fall, and the Pentagon immediately radios in on him. Mike tells Alan that his team needs some serious frickin' help, which ruffles the feather of General Clegg. The Army Chief of Staff tells Mike to stand down. He wants him out of there, like before they lose another hostage. Well, news for the my planning doesn't work for you! Morgan Allen Freeman reminds Clegg of his authority here as Commander-in-Chief, and Clegg starts to argue, but Morgan Freeman gives him the meanest Morgan Freeman mean eye I have ever seen him deliver on film. He does a little bit of that Forrest Whitaker eye twitch for emphasis, and this thoroughly shuts Clegg up, and the rest of the room for that matter. Allen, Allen tells Mike that they're going to give in to Kang's demand. Mike advises against it, but... But Alan's reasonable, and he reminds him that this is for the safety of the president. Mike tells him that there's a lot more at stake than just the safety of the president here. He pleads with Morgan Freeman, telling him that he's the president now. By golly, Mike's the best shot he's got at beating the bad guys and saving this ever-loving country. And Morgan is hesitant, but he decides to give Mike 30 minutes to wrap this movie up before he just gives in and lets the bad guys win. Leia. Leia gets a phone call at work from Mike. Mike, Mike, he's calling because he wants to make sure, to make sure that Leia knows that he cares before he goes on this suicide mission. They share this touching little call about their stressful days and how they're looking forward to date night tonight, which, you know, Mike might or might not be alive for, but hopefully will be. Mike tells her he loves her, and honestly, it's the most emotional moment throughout the entire film. Last phone call's done, Mike suits up and heads in for his suicide mission. He reveals himself to Kang via camera. Pretty dumb move, but okay. He tells Kang that he's not getting any of his demands. It's over for him. Kang threatens violence against the president, but Mike tells him it doesn't matter. He doesn't give a fuck. Mike's gonna make sure that Kang's way too dead to care about any of this United Korea stuff. This touches a soft spot on Kang, and he wants Mike off his TV screen. Mike assures him that he's not going anywhere. Mike threatens to stick a knife in Park Kang's brain and leak his deadly photos to the press. Park Kang cuts the transmission. Kang is pissed now. And all pissed off, Kang decides to take out his frustrations on Ruth. Ruth, now with the Cerberus code, no longer available there to keep her safe because she was instructed to give it away because Ben, like an a**, told her to give it up to the terrorists with barely any prompting at all. Now with no Cerberus code to keep her safe, Kang's guards cut some more of those freaking zip ties I love so much and can never seem to find just wasting them and throwing them on the ground, and they grab Ruth. And his guards grab Ruth and start to drag her off, and she starts kicking and screaming. And they try and drag her off, but she struggles so much, her jacket comes off in the process, all while moaning and hollering and crying. And then, and this isn't a joke, just out of nowhere, she just starts crying out the Pledge of Allegiance while they are dragging her through this hallway. Blood dripping from her mouth, just, just... Cry shouting, I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and they drag Ruth to the White House entrance and order her to walk out through the glass, which, I don't know, I think that's a little fun. Barefoot, of course, it's an obvious homage to Die Hard, and it's not quite too in your face. Honestly, I liked it. I liked this one a lot. And it really leaves the question, are they going to execute her, or are they going to let her go? Ladies and gentlemen, the verdict is... Well, well, it, it would be death for Ruth, but good old Mike thwarts King's plans by shooting one of King's soldiers. Taking another shot, dispatching another shoulder, King turns his gun on Mike, and Ruth takes advantage of the situation and runs like heck, all the way to safety. Atta girl, Ruth. Somebody's gotta live through this. I mean, some female character has to survive, so good for you, Ruth McMillan. Back to the gunfight, Mike clears the room of gunmen as King retreats to the bunker. Mike shoots two gunmen from the position he was at before moving just slightly down the hall and a little down the stairs and hiding behind a column in a way that would only really work in a stealth game. 
Akami Ninja comes up to investigate to make sure that the stairs are still stairs, but Mike flips from around the column by the stairs and shoots him in the face before ducking back behind the column. Another soldier runs up to investigate the dead body of his fallen comrade, but Mike rolls back around the same column and shoots him in the face as well. And just in time, we have another round of news montages to show the world reacting to the horrific events in America. Morgan Allen Freeman begrudgingly gives into Kang's demand, withdrawing the 7th Fleet, pulling American troops from the demilitarized zone, and apparently dooming South Korea. But, but don't count us out yet, folks. Because just like Solid Snake and Freddie Mercury alike, Mike Banning works best under pressure, and he's still got 20 minutes left to save the day. Park Kang and his Asian hacker lady friend can be seen in the height of North Korean celebration, sharing a slight nod towards each other as they acknowledge the withdrawal of the 7th Fleet. Park Kang and his accomplices begin to prepare the hostages for the next step of their plan as they start putting black bags over their heads, cutting them from their cable ties, and leading them out of the presidential bunker in a neat, orderly file. Several Nazi ninjas file into the elevator in front of the hostages, but just as the elevator closes, two soldiers pull down their hoods, wolves hiding among sheep. They huddle outside the White House, making their way across the White House lawn towards the helicopter. All targets unclear, no assassination attempts can be made on Kang. The helicopter leaves, but it blows up just shortly after taking off, and it's, it's confusing. There's confusion in the Pentagon as well, as the Joint Chiefs of Staff fear for the worst. The President must be dead. I mean, I mean, he must be dead, right? Everybody saw it. Kang had everybody go into the escape helicopter, hostages included. No one sighted Kang or Asher or anything like that, but they still saw people go into a helicopter. And that helicopter took off from the ground, and then it exploded. You know, like helicopters do sometimes. It, it didn't have some sort of mechanical error or anything like that. It was just another spontaneous helicopter explosion. You all know the helicopters. They're just exploding all over the places. It happens, it's tragic, and it's always a dark day for the nation. But we move on. Any helicopter explosion is tragic, really. But this, this was a particularly tragic helicopter explosion for America. Because this explosion might have had the president exploding in it. Probably. We think. Mike sees the wreck through a window from the White House. He radios into the Pentagon. He asks the Pentagon, what happened? And Alan... Morgan Allen Freeman, he responds with his best rationalization of the events that just took place. Kang must have killed himself in the helicopter along with all of the other hostages, including, of course, the president. Mike, though, he presses square to doubt. In what is my favorite line of the movie, Mike's like, Wait, this doesn't add up. That doesn't make any sense. Mike doesn't buy Kang killing himself. He thinks he has too much pride for an act like that. Mike thinks, maybe... Maybe. Maybe Kang's still in the bunker. With the president. Mike makes his way down to the bunker to dispatch Kang Parker Lewis forever. Okay, I know. Too late to add another surname onto Parker Kang, but I do like Kang Parker Lewis. Had I come up with it earlier, we might have been using it the whole way through. It kind of has a ring to it. Anywho, my name games aside, Mike makes his way down to the bunker, and surprise, surprise, Kang is still there with the president. Now, Kang... Kang, he has by this point activated the Cerberus system, having extracted the final code from Ben. Seriously, like, Ben, how could you give up all three codes so easily? You suck. Kang is ready to implement his super stupid, super secret plan to destroy America. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, this oh-so-clever Kang, he, instead of using the system to help protect North Korea from nuclear strike, he just, uh, gee, oh golly, he... He's going to blow up the missiles in the silo, and that's just something shucks. No one had ever shuck and thought about. So yeah, so Kang plans on exploding each silo, detonating each missile just in their spot. Just causing a massive destruction all across America. This has been his whole plan the whole time. This is what the whole thing was all about. Parker Kang says North Korea is a sucky place to live, and he wants to make America equally as sucky as North Korea. That's, that's essentially his rationale for this entire movie. That's the premise of this movie and the reason for these North Korean terrorists, is they just want to make America equivalently crappy as North Korea is crappy. Now, too, America shall know suffering and famine. But you know, North Korea isn't a nuclear wasteland, Bob, and it's confusing because it's one thing to be patriotic, 
and think your country's great. I get that. That makes sense. It's another thing to think your country sucks and want to improve your country because you love it. But to love your country so much that you want all other countries to suck as badly as your country does? Hmm. We go back to the ADC outside as we get more news montages. The Pentagon is alerted to the activation of the Cerebrus system. And finally, finally Morgan Allen Freeman figures out the plot to the movie. Right, a little bit behind the ball. But but he's there now, and, and now he can spell it out to us in nice, simple words that we can all understand. So Kang is going to blow up the missiles. In their silos. Oh my gosh. Right. Panic at the Pentagon begins to erupt. And this is not just another emo rock band. The self-destruct system has been activated. The United United States States of America America will explode explode in five five minutes. minutes. All personnel personnel evacuate evacuate immediately. immediately. After entering the Cerberus code, a five-minute counter appears on the Cerberus computer. Planned explosions from earlier that I didn't bother to mention go off, blowing a hole in one of the walls. And Ben is dragged out of the bunker through the hole that King has just exploded in the basement wall. But Mike, Mike is on the draw. He runs into the room, dropping into a knee slide that don't make no sense, only to grab a guy's assault rifle, wrestle it from him, and then beat him over the head with it. Meanwhile, King and the president struggle. King, seeing Mike kill his henchman behind him, King shoots the president in the stomach, and Mike goes into rage mode. He runs at King, knocking him against the wall. He tries to grab King's hands both tightly holding his gun, and Mike smashes them against the wall. Kang drops his gun. He whips Mike around, bashing him against the wall in return. Kang punches him quickly in the stomach, but Mike double back with a roundhouse left to the side of Kang's face. Kang reels backward. Mike comes in again with the right. Kang seems stunned. Then again, just as quickly, Mike comes in with the left again. It's a strong left knocking Kang back. Mike bull rushes him, knocking him against the opposite wall. Punching him once, twice, three times in the stomach before Kang regains control. Kneeing Mike twice in quick succession in the stomach as well. Mike doubles over in pain. (sighs) Withdrawing for a moment, Kang pulls a pair of Connie throwing knives. Jabbing towards him, Mike narrowly dodges, avoiding getting shanked. He dodges, punching at his wrist. Knocking one Connie out of his hand, and then he kicks him square in the chest. Knocking him backwards, further disarming him. Obviously. Kang makes a couple quick punches at Mike, which he deflects before Kang roundhouse kicks him in the face, directing him directly to the floor. Mike grabs one of the knives while he's down there, and what's this? I thought that part Kang had Cooney, but I, I, I must have Asian blindness, because I'm a fool, and Mike clearly is grabbing a common steak knife off the floor. He, he holds it backwards, in a fancy, fancy defensive pose. Kang kicks at Mike, but Mike... Now with his backward steak knife can easily block those kicks with his forearm. Mike moves in for a hard open palm slap, but Kang drops back and avoids the slap. Mike goes to stab him, but Kang deflects with his kung fu action grip, grabbing Mike by the throat and throwing him against the wall. They struggle for the knives, neither able to get control of it. They drop it on the floor. Kang, Kang swings at Mike, but Mike ducks, then blocks, then ducks, then blocks, then takes a nice shine into the face. Park grabs Mike by the neck, strangling him. Mike struggles, gasping for air, the light fading from his eyes. Park King looks over to see if Asher is dead, and in his moment of distraction, Mike attacks, learning from his enemies. This time, Mike is the one doing the karate chops. He karate chops King right in the arm, releasing his grip, before Mike grabs his arm, pulling him down, and kicks him hard in the face. Then again, just, just hard in the face. Then Mike wraps his leg around his neck and flips him back down onto the cold stone floor, all Steve Austin style, just making a mess out of Park King's cranium, stabbing him squarely in the forehead. (laughs) Just as Mike promised King he would. F***ing awesome! Right, Raul? I love it when there's good payoff. And now, Mike and Ben finally have their moment of reunion together. Too bad Ben is dying of a gunshot wound, but still, it's nice, though. You know, Mike breaks out something to stop the blood foe for Ben, but Ben Ben is too worried about Cerberus. And, and with reason. Mike only has one minute to stop the missile silos all across America from exploding. Eek! Mike tells Ben. And he actually breaks protocol and calls him Ben here instead of Sir, which is surprising for Mike. He tells him to keep this pack pressed on his wound. And he's gonna be okay. Alright. Villain killed. Check. President saved. Check. Now it's time to save the world. Mike asks the Pentagon how to shut off Cerberus. Now, 
Has anyone out there ever played the game, keep talking and nobody explodes? Because that's essentially what is happening here. For those not in the know, I'll explain. Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes is a VR game where one person is wearing a VR headset and before them is a bomb. The other people in the room have access to small books about bombs. The players need to talk and describe things to each other in order to defuse the bomb and not to explode. So the Pentagon, in the same kind of vein, starts describing things to Mike that Mike should be able to find on the Cerberus control panel. And I gotta give it to Mike under so much pressure that he has the focus skills of a god. 40 seconds left. All that's left to do is enter the deactivation code. Why are all these codes so long and complicated? There's 10 frickin' seconds left until explosion. 5, 4, 3. Cerberus has been deactivated. Mike and Ben walk out of the White House together, leaning on each other for support. So beautiful. So romantic. Mike apologizes for the house, but Ben tells him it's okay. He's pretty sure it's insured. Applause from the Pentagon as Morgan Freeman loses his position as acting president. Father and son reunite as Connor reemerges. Beard and Beast reunite as Leia rushes towards Mike's side. Of course, Benjamin Asher has to give one last patriotic speech about rebuilding the nation and something yada 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 about honor, integrity, God blessing the freedom of our majesty. You know that old chestnut. Ben steps off the stage, gives Mike an intense, passionate stare, and shakes his hand. Mike leans back. He's back to being the president's bodyguard. And all is good with life again, and I'm sure, I'm sure that, that after all that whole Christmas car crash debacle and the White House exploding incident, I'm sure that everything is just going to be smooth sailing and easy paychecks from here on out for good old Mike Bannon. And that, that all my bad movie Among Us friends, that was Gerard Butler's Die Hard in the White House, his would-be action thriller. This movie was born to happen, whether it was going to be Transfer of Power or whether it was going to be this movie here. Gerard Butler was going to be the man to do it, to kick, punch, and knee-slide his way to justice in this awe-inspiringly dumb political action thriller. That was the one, the only, the massively commercially viable, Olympus, Olympus has fallen. That might have been the end of the movie, but that's not the end of this episode. Stay tuned for some fun facts about this flick. Well, with the movie over, we are on to some fantastic facts about this stupendously stupid movie. What have you got for us, Nohea? During the writing process, the attack on the White House was planned by ex-Secret Service agents who were asked on how they would attack the White House if they had to. Allegedly, Angela Bassett only signed on to her role as Secret Service Director Lynn Jacobs because she saw it as an excuse to work alongside Morgan Freeman. Which, I would too. Yeah, right. Despite real-world tensions between North Korea and the United States in 2013, director Antoine Fuqua said that he did not want the film's villains to be from the Middle East because other films had covered that to the point of saturation. He found North Korea interesting because it was completely closed off from the rest of the world and no one really knows what they're capable of. An early trailer used actual emergency alert system tones that are used for real-life emergencies and because playing them outside of an emergency broadcast violates federal law, the FCC fined ESPN, Viacom, and NBC Universal Studios $1.93 million in response. All the White House tourist scenes were filmed in Louisiana. With the weather being so hot, a Humane Society representative insisted that the German Shepherds playing the canine watchdogs stay in an air-conditioned van between shoots. In an interesting political nod, in the White House, there is a room called the Roosevelt Room. This room's portrait changes in relation to the political party of the president. If the president is a Republican, a portrait of Theodore Teddy Roosevelt is portrayed. However, if the president is a Democrat, then Franklin D. FDR Roosevelt is hung up instead. In one particular scene in Olympus Has Fallen, you can watch as Mike passes FDR's portrait in a hallway. This is very interesting because it insinuates that with FDR's portrait in the hallway, that must mean that Teddy's portrait is hung up in the Roosevelt room instead, confirming that President Asher is in fact a Republican. Morgan Freeman began each day of filming by serenading the extras with old jazz songs and pranking unsuspecting crew members. As an interesting addition to our favorite female actress in the movie, Angela Bassett, just like the character of Ripley in Alien, the role of Lynn Jacobs was originally written to be played by a man. After Bassett's audition, however, the role was rewritten for a woman. And that's great, because the movie needed more female characters. There's all but three of them, and pretty much all of them are inconsequential to the plot. And also, I feel like Lynn Jacobs could still be played by a man. There's nothing about the character that really defined her as a woman, in my opinion. 
Between takes, Melissa Leo, who plays your badass Secretary of Defense Ruth McMillan, she did step-ups on an apple box to keep up her heart rate and keep up that sweaty, raggedy-looking appearance. But, but honestly, it's not her fault. Melissa Leo is not hair, she is not makeup, and she is not the director. And also, she had to wear a wig for that role. Oh my god, that makes so much sense. That's why she looks like Oscar the Grouch after a dumpster fire. Yeah, Melissa Leo's hair as Ruth was also a brown wig because she needed to keep her hair long while she was shooting the final season of HBO's series Treme. Boldly, Morgan Freeman has openly stated in interviews that he did all three films of the Has Fallen trilogy just for money. And good on you, Morgan. Good on you. As an unnecessary detail, when Mike gives his badge to Connor, just as Connor is about to escape, you might notice that Mike's badge is a little different than the badges that the Secret Service agents carry, and that is because Mike has been working for the Treasury Department, and Treasury agents carry different badges. Author Vince Flynn has a series of novels that feature the character Mitch Rapp, a CIA operative. And in the third book of the Rapp saga, titled Transfer of Power, Mitch Rapp is sent to rescue the president, in his bunker after terrorists successfully infiltrate and take over the White House. To add insult to injury to author Vince Flynn, Gerard Butler was set to star as Mitch Rapp in a proposed film adaptation of one of the novels. Flynn, you were done dirty. As a point of accuracy for Olympus's part, the Sergeant Major of the Army, the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, and the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps can be seen in the Pentagon Crisis Room. During a crisis like the one in the movie, these ranking officers are brought into the Pentagon to help with the strategics, and also for their general protection. The news reporter that reports about the U.S. forces leaving the Korean demilitarized zone and the 7th Fleet leaving the Sea of Japan is an actual news reporter. Hamish MacDonald is an Australian news reporter who was working at Channel 10 News at the time of production. He is now based in London as a foreign correspondent for ABC News America. Rick Yoon, who portrayed the terrorist leader in Olympus Has Fallen, played another North Korean terrorist and arms dealer in Pierce Brosnan's last James Bond film, Die Another Day. Rick was also born in Washington, D.C., ironically considering the location of the movie, but the film was mostly filmed in Shreveport, Louisiana. So, just to note, the giant aircraft that you see in the beginning of the movie, that's a modified Lockheed AC-130. Now, that itself is a modified C-130 Hercules, and in the movie, the Lockheed has two GM M134 miniguns mounted on each side, but in real life, the aircraft only has guns mounted to its left side to provide close air support to ground troops as well as other high-risk tasks. Now, we'll also note that we did a little bit of researching on this entire attack, and it it mostly follows some sort of accuracy there some sort of accuracy some sort of bare bones accuracy right a lot of the stuff that the aircraft does in the movie it can actually do in real life it can actually do the anti-defense mechanisms against the f-22 raptors Mm -hmm. those are called angel flares right c-130 has those now could the c-130 actually make it there from north korea it's possible it's possible if it refueled over russia because it almost has enough fuel it almost has a high enough distance And so this is one of those things where it's just so remarkably absurd and then so frustrating then because as you research it, it all just barely fits inside this possible spectrum box. And you're like, just break that box. And it's like, no, no, it's all totally possible. This could totally 100% realistically happen. And you're like, no, it couldn't. It could not. This is nonsense. Why even? And they're like, it doesn't matter. It could happen. North Korea could do this. Right. Right. Well, there's a part two of this for White House Down, too. Right. There is a part two of this for White House Down. It's a whole nother experience with a whole nother kind of attack. Right. Now, like we said, those interceptor planes that you see, those are actually Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor jets designed for air superiority and interception roles. Jeez. What is this, the Military History Channel? I know. I know. So this marks Dylan McDermott's second time playing a Secret Service agent as he played another one in the 1993 film In the Line of Fire. Morgan Freeman, who plays the Speaker of the House in this movie, has actually been in five other movies with actress Ashley Judd, who plays the late Mrs. Asher. This is the only film in which they don't share any screen time together, which, you know, isn't surprising when you kill her off in the first eight minutes of the movie. What is even more remarkable to me is that in the original theatrical trailer, they kill her off roughly at the 30-second mark, which is just insane. I do not see how you can kill off 
the First Lady of the United States of America in the first 30 seconds of your theatrical trailer. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's absurd. It's absurd. Morgan Freeman has also been in three other movies with Rada Mitchell, who portrayed Leia, Mike's wife. But like Ashley Judd, Rada shares no screen time with Morgan in this film, nor its sequel, London Has Fallen, as Morgan Freeman was only interested in acting with Angela Bassett. Morgan Freeman, the busybody that he is, has been in two other films with Aaron Eckhart, the actor who portrays President Asher, one of them featuring a caped crusader that you might just know. The Phantom. <laughs> I thought it was Zorro. Zorro! Or was it, was it Superman? Su Who's Superman? Oh right, his name was Doomsday. Doomsday, I'm familiar with Doomsday. Yeah. Including this feature film, Morgan Freeman has played President of the United States a total of three times. It feels like he's been the President so many more times than that. Right. I'm not even sure if that was counting the last Has Fallen film. I know, because it does get dicey with those counts uh, as to whether they're counting him as an elected President or as an acting President. Right, or like just if the character is President once, does that count already? Right. Our strong and sassy nurse, Rada Mitchell, started Pitch Black alongside Cole Hauser, who delivers the infamous Olympus Has Fallen line in the movie. And I had like a weird Universe B moment with that line. I could have sworn that Gerard Butler said that line, and not like Cole Hauser. But, I don't know. I feel like that will eventually be one of those Mandela Effect incidents, because remembering back, I honestly really thought Gerard Butler said it. The typeface used for the word Olympus in the poster and logo of the movie Olympus Has Fallen is actually the same logo borrowed from the company Olympus, which is a manufacturer of optics and cameras. Chief of sons of bitches. And how many of those cameras have audio? How many? How many, Connor? How many? Four! <laughs> <laughs> Coincidentally, actor Phil Austin, who plays the vice president in this movie, looks an awful lot like former vice president Mike Pence. Which, you know, awful lot. Awful lot. Like, uncanny. Uncanny Valley a little. So Connor's a pretty big fan of the Alex Ryder series, as he's seen reading the eighth book of the series, this one titled Crocodile Tears. Alex Ryder's is about a kid super spy around Connor's age, and I used to read them around Connor's age too. Uh, at least the first one. Towards the end of the movie, when Morgan Freeman tells Gerard Butler that he has 30 minutes left, that is the actual remaining time left in the film. Ha 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 ha! Ha ha, how clever. Filmed in front of his live studio ostrich. <laughs> 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 and across 12 movies, including a spinoff with other franchise favorite Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees has killed 153 people. Which means that Olympus Has Fallen has shattered that record in a single movie with 168 dead Americans. And that is interesting. And there are a lot of Greek motifs in this movie as well. Olympus is the code word for White House in this movie, and Olympus is the mountain home of the gods in Greek mythology. The Cerberus Code is another obvious reference to Greek mythology, as Cerberus is a three-headed dog that guards the gates to the underworld, and in this movie the Cerberus system requires three separate codes to be entered in order to stop a global apocalypse and the end of the world. Yes. And that about covers it for our trivia section of Olympus Has Fallen. With Olympus Has Fallen out of the way, stay tuned for part three as we bring you White House Down. <laughs>